I did not believe it at first. I thought I was misreading something. And there it was, the special citation for the journals of Ukraine. And I remember just looking for a long time at the words. Earlier this week, the board of the Pulitzer Prizes, the top journalism prize in the U.S., gave a special citation to Ukraine's journalists, noting their courage, endurance, and commitment to truthful reporting about the war in their country. It was very meaningful to me because the journalists in Ukraine are doing incredible work right now, being at the epicenter of this crisis, putting their feelings and their emotions away to keep doing this job. This is Voices of Ukraine, a podcast from the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. I'm Masha Udensova Brenner, the Institute's media manager. And the voice you just heard is a 33-year-old Ukrainian journalist and editor who's been on the ground doing this job since the war started. My name is Olga Rudenko, and I'm the editor-in-chief of the Kyiv Independent. If you've been following the war, you've probably heard of the KU Independent. It's an English-language Ukrainian news site with a huge following. And though what you just heard was recorded yesterday, today you'll be hearing a conversation with Olga that took place much earlier in the war, and it gets deep into the experience that she just described. Putting your feelings away to keep reporting on a war unfolding in your own country. But first, I want to introduce our guest interviewer, who will be with us for the next few episodes. My name is Lily Bivings. I'm currently a master's student at Columbia's Harriman Institute, and I am a contributing editor for the Kiev Independent. Lily is a close friend of Olga Rudenko's. They met last year when they were both working at another English language site, the Kiev Post, where Olga was deputy chief editor. At the time, the Post was a big deal. It was, since the mid 90s, the largest, most read English language newspaper in Ukraine. The Post was read primarily by the international community government officials, foreign journalists, NGO workers anyone who wanted to get an accurate picture about what was going on in Ukraine. But then everything changed. Last fall, the oligarch who owned the post fired everyone without notice. It appears that the owner, Adnan Kivan, was essentially fed up with the journalists for defending their editorial independence. Reportedly, he was pressured by the government of Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky because it didn't like the paper's critical coverage. Zelensky's administration was not very friendly to journalists. It was no secret that people didn't love the Kyiv Post for their coverage of corruption and of officials and of the government. Of course, it's hard to say, but certainly seems that may have had something to do with it. Many of the fired staff banded together and decided to create a new site and call it KU Independent. This was last November, At that point, Lily was already studying full-time in New York, and Olga was in Chicago on fellowship, hoping to take a sabbatical from journalism. But when her colleagues asked her to lead the KU Independent, Olga couldn't say no, and Lily, who was in grad school full-time, started helping out too, by editing the new site's daily newsletter. Then, after Russia invaded Ukraine in February, Lily's former colleagues needed all the help they could get, And she became an editor again, studying by day and working for KU Independent by night. Oh, and just so there's no confusion, Lily is not Ukrainian. She fell in love with Ukraine when she served in the Peace Corps there four years ago. And she's planning to spend the rest of her life there, by whatever means possible. What follows is an edited and condensed version of a conversation Lily had with Olga over Zoom two weeks after Russia invaded Ukraine. At the time, KU was under heavy bombardment and Olga was in Western Ukraine. I actually wanted to talk about Kiev Independent. You know, what what was it like before? What were you guys covering before the the full invasion started? Oh, wow, I can hardly remember now. It seems like it's been ages, and it's only been really two weeks. Well, obviously, in the several weeks right before the invasion, we did focus a lot on security issues because there were these constant reports that the invasion is imminent, it's going to happen you know, this Wednesday or this Sunday. By the time it actually happened, it was almost like the uh, boy who cried wolf. We were almost too tired from, you know, so many warnings and thinking that it won't actually happen. And then it happened. 
by the time the war started, it was still very startupish. I I really wanted to build the right culture in the company. And now all that went to hell because there's no culture building anymore. There's no business coverage anymore. There's no quality coverage anymore. There's just this horrible war, and everybody is in, is is a war reporter in the newsroom. You know the, the two two lifestyle reporters that we had. One is covering uh, refugees and the war, and, and uh, the second one has actually joined the territorial defense force and is defending the country. So that's how everything was turned upside down for us. I wanted to talk a little bit about the sort of meteoric rise of Kiev independence since the start of Russia's full-scale invasion. It's so exciting, obviously, to jump from 20,000 followers to almost 2 million, to get recognized by every major outlet, to get all of the compliments from everyone all over the world. But the reason why that's happening is obviously tragic and I think we all wish wasn't the reason why we're getting this kind of success. Yes, you know, just a month ago this this, this kind of numbers seemed so far away for us. But it's it's all very very bittersweet. Obviously the reason why we have this kind of fellowship and this kind of recognition is because our country which we all care so deeply about is uh going through through this horrible horrible war and I would happily trade all the success that we had for there being no war and I'd be happy to live in a boring, boring Ukraine and I'd be happy if my only struggle was how to stay afloat as a media startup and how to find money. I said to someone the other day, I was like, it's crazy that at one point the most stressful thing was Thursday night's Keith Post and I'd love to just go back to those days where we came into work late on Fridays, we drank wine in the office late at night after we were done. Yeah, in in retrospective, it's also so easy, so simple, so well, peaceful. One of the things I would always tell people about why I love Ukraine so much is it's just, it's so laid back there. And I don't mean laid back in this dismissive way of not being hardworking or responsible, but in a sort of deeper, more philosophical way and like an attitude towards life it's hard to kind of even grasp the reality of what's happening and and to tie it into the news that we're reporting people ask me all the time how are you feeling how are you doing and I'm like I don't really have time to think about it I mean I'm also not there right you just said you know I'm not even there I think it might be even harder for people who are not here to cope with this because that just adds some additional level of absurdity look at the look at the news you're into it for hours and hours and then you go uh, out to the street and it's it's also normal and i think that this contrast can really take a toll on you you know mentally that's what happened to me one day after the war started i left kiev and i went to a safer location in western ukraine for the first first couple of days, I, I thought I was going insane. I thought I was going mad for just, just the the crazy contrast of how peaceful the streets were, how there was like almost no sign of that this is the same country that is at war right now. How that contrasted with what I was doing all day, all looking at the news, editing the news, writing the news, the shelling, the tragedies, people in bomb shelters. And then, you know, I woke up from my computer and it's also normal around me. Literally, what was going on around you? Like, what were people doing? It's it's, it's a very small town. I, I mean, I haven't had a chance to walk around that much. I think a couple of streets is like almost the whole town. A lot of places are closed. Some cafes and shops. But most of them are open, actually. And most of them are working. And I spend a lot of time working in a, in a restaurant at a ho- hotel nearby but it has a, a big restaurant with a good internet connection uh the best one that i could find here so far so so i spend like most of my days there working um and it's um that's a spa hotel and it's full now of people who fled i think most of kiev there's a there's a pool and uh, uh like an indoor pool for you know families with children swim there no alcohol of course because it's bad now but it's you know it's also normal. It's almost like a resort. It's almost like a vacation. That hit me really badly in the first several days. I looked around me and I thought, this is this is too good. This is too comfortable. Like I feel horrible for being here. 
and then you know a couple of days after i arrived the first um uh, the first air raid alert happened here and it's a horrible and very silly thing to say maybe but i was almost relieved that this is like you know the reality is becoming more more solid around me i know that why you would feel it of course it makes perfect sense but the people that love you and care about you are so happy that you are safe and so you're kind of doing a service for other people too when you get yourself to safety or if you can get yourself to safety you know it kind of got a little easier because i think i just started thinking more practically and realizing then that by being here i can be useful and uh, i can do more work and i'd be probably virtually useless if i stayed in kiev because i would have to go to the subway which was the bomb shelter that was available to me and there was no internet connection and i would be you know offline for big chunks of the day and my apartment is not safe there is something that everybody in ukraine knows now which is called the rule of two walls you know what the rule of two walls is no explain it there have to be two walls between you and the street which is why people who don't go to bomb shelters who stay in their apartments and when there is um, a threat of shelling they stay either in the corridor or in the bathroom and uh, my apartment it's a, it's it's a very small apartment there's no place where there can be two walls between you and the street i never really thought of what it is like to live in a city under air strikes because things that you read about in, uh, in the books about london blitz you know would i be scared or not but i was honestly so scared when i heard the the explosions over kiev when it all started i couldn't have guessed that i would be so scared of hearing that several days after i left kiev i actually bought a train ticket back which i hoped to be able to use in a couple of days it made me feel good to have the ticket but then the the russians hit the tv tower in kiev and that's very close to my place and i thought first of all i easily could have been near the tower and be among the several people who were killed there and secondly i'd be probably paralyzed for maybe the whole day i i don't know what i'm trying to say is while it's absolutely horrible to watch it it's also i think making it a little easier to justify you know not being there i think you know a lot of people want to stay they want to stay in, in these parts cuz they it's their home or they want to report on it or something but ultimately like you know you know what i also noticed i also i also noticed this thing it happens to many people especially people who are a little older than us they stubbornly don't want to leave their homes even when it gets really dangerous and they are never able to give a reason it's like a stupor there's something fatalistic about it my 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 parents had this too like i I'm now in a very intense negotiation trying to make them leave for safe allocation. They just want to stay there. You're facing the prospect of death, but instead of running, you just freeze and you look it in the eyes, you know. I think some people maybe just like their brain isn't really registering it and they think it's not going to happen to them or it, it may be connected to what you said earlier about the kind of laid back peaceful vibe that Ukraine has it's almost like it it's rooted in the same place i don't know it's like um uh, it's the come what my attitude a lot of characteristics of ukrainians in ukrainian society are really like coming to the forefront that's what's been cool for me i've been trying to tell people for years the things that the world is now seeing about ukrainians and no one has believed me do you feel triumphant now exactly <laughs> i've vindicated It's amazing to watch Ukrainians unite around this and to fight back and to be pretty successful in in not letting their country fall thus far. But it's also just so annoying to me that Ukraine has had like, has to fight for its existence so much and to to at such a large cost. It's the the injustice of it is frustrating. I understand what you what you're saying about injustice of having to fight for for your right to exist, but also it's uh every time you're picking up a fight like that you're going kind to of find in very something very important it's like something crystallizes something is 
becoming more more clear to you about who you are, about your identity. I don't think it's an exaggeration or, or romanticizing to say that this is like part of this struggle to become the country that it wants to become. And it has, it unfortunately, you know, I guess has to go through these things to solidify the country it wants to be and to pursue the dreams that it has for itself as a country. Again, again, this is something I, I read online. I uh, don't remember who said it, but it seems like Russia is at war with itself right now. I mean, even though they're not showing their own cities, they're destroying something very, very important about their nation by, you know, doing this crime that... That is a collective crime. I don't think that this is it, it, it's Putin to blame for it. I think it's uh, the whole Russia to blame for it. I mean, whatever happens, whatever happens next in terms of you know the the battles and uh, which cities are taken, which cities are liberated, we are winning it. It's like an ultimate test that the, the nation is taken, and we are nailing the test. I don't know if I'm. My mind is just telling me to tell myself that this will be over soon and this summer we'll all be back in Kiev going to like our favorite bars and cafes and going to the beach and hanging out and these you know long summer nights like just to make myself feel better and I've thought about it a lot and I'm like no but I really believe that I'm trying not to think that this is probably what people who left uh, Donetsk and Luhansk told themselves in 2014 but I'm always a uh, a naive romantic optimist. Maybe it won't be the same, you know, the same city. Of course it won't be the same city. It will forever be transformed. But it doesn't mean that it will it will be worse. It will still be our Kiev and we will all go back. We will walk and laugh and uh, just be happy. I I don't see it happening. I don't see Kiev being gone. In early April, a few weeks after Olga and Lily spoke, Russian forces retreated from KU. Olga went back to the capital and is still there. She continues to stay, even though the occasional missile still hits the city, and in late April, Vera Hirich, a producer at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty in KU, was killed by a Russian strike on a residential block. Olga's parents, who live in central Ukraine, never did leave their home. KU Independent is continuing to grow. They now have 2.1 million followers on Twitter, and four of its journalists made it onto Forbes' 30 under 30 list this month. One of them, Toma Istomina, will be on the show next week for another interview with Lily. As the war drags on, Lily says that the optimism she and Olga were feeling during that early conversation has turned into a bit of hopelessness. We know that Ukraine will win, she says, but it's hard to say when, and not knowing is hard. Lily and all the staff at Kiyu Independent are exhausted. But at least the Pulitzer citation has been a bit of a morale booster. I'd be remiss not to mention that Ukrainian journalists do have some issues with the wording, because the citation refers to Russia's war as Vladimir Putin's war. Here's Olga again. We in Ukraine know that it is not Vladimir Putin's war, it is Russia's war. There are tens of thousands of people who are participating, and it is shown by independent polling that Russians overwhelmingly support the war. So calling it Putin's war is just it's just plain wrong. I think it's diminishing the scale of this tragedy. So that was unfortunate that the Pulitzer Prize people chose that language to describe what is going on. If you're looking for ways to support the people of Ukraine, please consider donating to razumforukraine.org. That's R-A-Z-O-M for Ukraine.org. It was founded in 2014 in the wake of Ukraine's Revolution of Dignity by Dora Komiak, who's on the Harriman Institute's National Advisory Council. The organization has been working directly with volunteers in Ukraine to provide emergency relief where it's needed most. Thank you for listening to Voices of Ukraine from the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. I'm Mashi Densiba Brenner. This episode was written and produced by me and edited by Ann Cooper. The music in the series is by Ivan Nebesny, who's currently in Lviv. 
We wish him, Olga, her family, the staff of KU Independent, and all the people of Ukraine safety and strength. The cover art is by Victoria Tentler Krolov. A huge thank you to Jordan Waller, Marko Andrejcik, and Nathan Schiller for their feedback on the episode. If you like the show, please subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a review.